All right, everybody, so this is the uh, food web lecture looking at trophic levels and trophic positions. So um, what is a trophic level? A uh, trophic level is basically, you know, what we generally think of that as primary producers, uh, herbivores, predators, top predators, that kind of thing, right? But the way it's formally defined is that it is the um, number of energy transfers to get to species of interest plus one. Okay, so species D, it's in, you know, it's an herbivore, so it is the number of links, so one plus one, it's trophic level two. Basically, plants are trophic level one, uh, herbivores trophic level two, uh, you know, primary predators are, they're going to be trophic level three. Okay, now this makes sense for a food web where it's very clearly defined what is eating and, you know, species don't eat that many other types of species, right? So the problem becomes with what about omnivory, okay? So species F here is an um, omnivorous species and um, it eats let's say 50% of it, its diet is, oops, sorry, 50% uh, of its diet is from species A and 50%, oh, sorry, I should have written D here, right? Um, what is the trophic position of species F, right? There, it's not necessarily three anymore because, you know, the, uh, it eats partly from D, partly from A. So we could kind of maybe say it is 2.5, right? Since if 50% of its diet is coming from species A, 50% of it is coming from species D, you could like average, you know, that there's one and that um, uh, one trophic link plus one. So, you know, you could say, um, 50% of it is trophic level two and then 50% of it because it feeds on D is is you know one link two links so that's three so um, two plus one is three so you know average two and three and you get two and a half right um, so it bec comes though a little trickier again if let's say you have 50 75 percent of its diet is from species D and 25 percent species A depicted here by the um, different, uh, you know, thicknesses of those lines, uh, we would expect then in this scenario for a species F to be higher than two and a half, right? So you could, you know, um, take that it's, it's based on its, based on its diet, three times 0.75, two times 0.25 and get an average, essentially an answer of 2.75. And um, you can do this, but um, it, it, it becomes really quickly, be, or it becomes really tricky very quickly because, um, you know, what are you basing the diet on? Are you basing it on biomass, number of calories? Um, there's lots of different ways you can see this. Is, is this 75% uh, due to numbers, right? Does it eat more of species D? based on numbers, but maybe it needs more of species A based on biomass. So, so it's, it's a little tricky and um, the, when we talk about stable isotopes here in uh, not the next lecture, but the next one, uh, we'll talk a little bit about how we can like integrate that, that idea a little bit better um, by using a different method rather than just looking at you know, what it directly eats. So um, I should have def defined here that, you know, the idea of looking at like one, trophic level one, trophic level two, and trophic level three is looking at trophic levels, whereas trophic position is more looking at kind of like this idea where we're, we're giving it an integrative number based on the amount of uh, the diet of what it's eating. So um, when we so so that's looking at trophic position from a you know a single species or single individual perspective, but we can look at how uh, food chains um, or a food web's maximum trophic position it, and what determines that. So we can ask that question basically: How long can a food chain be? 
And the first hypothesis that uh, a lot of people have looked at that we find mixed evidence for, frankly, is that it's productivity limited, right? So we know that with each step here, going from producers to primary consumers, right, you get about a 90% energy loss, right? A 90% loss. So I, I didn't really make this the right size, but you know, this should be this this primary consumer width should be much less than you know about 90% less uh, biomass or 90% less energy in the food web below it, right? And then you have another 90% loss, right? So eventually, what you can see is you quickly run out of energy. So um, you can't you know put another another species in here that's you know like really thin right because essentially the the population size here would be um, basically insufficient to um, to like create a stable population right you'd run into inbreeding problems and basically the population would just go away it's because there um, wasn't enough <coughs> um, productivity so insufficient energy to support population of tertiary consumers. Sorry, I f forgot. I shouldn't have written that up there on the top. Whatever. But you wouldn't have a tertiary consumer in this situation. Whereas if you ha started off with a lot more, right? So, you know, we've only got this much biomass. But if we start off with a whole lot of biomass all the way, you know, here, we can expect to have even with a 90% loss you get you know primary consumers secondary consumers potentially tertiary consumers and quaternary consumers um, so this this productivity this energy limit um, is is a hypothesis that says you know the more energy you have the more the and more energy you have flowing through the system the more um, trophic levels you can actually have the longer the food chain can be but um, a lot of things don't show this to be the case a lot of, of um, direct observation of food webs that show that to not necessarily be the case so there's other uh, hypotheses out there that have a lot more uh, not necessarily not really mixed evidence but um, uh, uh, I should say evidence or explanations that only work in certain types of habitats um, and it has to do with ecosystem size so you know generally what we see is predators are size dependent right a um, predator is usually bigger than its prey now that's not necessarily true with like lions eating water buffalo or a lion eating a wildebeest, right? So, um, but there's most of the time what we see is the predators are bigger than their prey, especially within aquatic ecosystems, okay? Um, so what do larger predators need? Um, if you're gonna basically then increase the food chain, you need bigger and bigger predators. So you need larger prey. So, a larger predator then is going to need a bigger and bigger home range to collect the necessary energy, right? Now, again, this this idea is mostly tested with lakes. Um, it doesn't really that much apply to a um, terrestrial ecosystems. It, it it's a little harder because you can't like block it off. I guess you could maybe do an experiment where you're like fencing things and see how many food web web how long the food web is in within just the uh, you know a, like fenced area but it's just it's a lot harder so you know we use lakes as natural ecosystem experiments and we found that um, bigger lakes tend to have uh, more big predators tend to have a higher maximum trophic position um, and in, and this can be, you know, the case, or this is this is obvious, right? Are you going to be able to catch this muskie in a pond the size of, 
you know, an acre or, you know, like a city block? And the ad answer is no, you're not going to. This big musky, this 40 some inch, you know, 20 pound fish is going to be eating a lot of things every day. So it needs to, um, it needs to be a bigger area, right? Their smaller lakes just don't harbor fish of that size. So the, you might ask the question, why do we care about trophic position? Yeah, we can, that, you know, there's a informational knowledge that you, knowing um, that a given lake of a given size will produce a food web of, you know, three or four uh, trophic levels. But, you know, that's n maybe not necessarily important to people. But what is important is what, or what we see is that um, trophic position really tells us a lot on um, how much toxins will be in a fish, right? So um, there's bioaccumulation, right? So mercury, PCBs, dioxins, a lot of these persistent chemicals can um, be uh, not very common or in low concentrations in uh, plankton feeders, in, in this case, small fish, right? But as we go through this uh, marine food web and as we go up and the um, fish that are eating smaller fish and the fish that are eating smaller fish that eat smaller fish, right? And once you get those big, big predators, they're going to be full of those mercury and PCBs and dioxins. So we don't necessarily, we, we can take shortcuts. We don't necessarily need to, um, you know, directly measure the, the toxins in a specific lake. Um, you know, if we know that there is some exposure to toxins, we can just say, don't eat, you know, don't eat northern pike from Lake Koshkanon, right? Or don't eat northern pike and walleye from, you know, Lake St. Germain up nor in northern Wisconsin. Um, now, I, I don't know if those lakes actually have toxin problems, but um, it, it allows us to take shortcuts so that we don't have to specifically measure the amount of toxins in each individual species. All right, with that. I'll see you later.